Ephesians 2 and 8 through 10. Anyone want to recite that from heart out loud? Tomas, you got it? No? You got it in your Bible though, right? Let's, let's read it together. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So what we're talking about tonight is uh, Moses, and how God prepared him for very specific works of service to his people. And as always, whenever we look at God's word, we need to ask ourselves, how does this apply to me? Right? So, our key truths for tonight are that God prepares us to serve him, and God has a place of service for each of us. Okay? So... What do you think it means in verse uh, 10 of Ephesians 2 that God prepared works of service for us in advance for us to do? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Scott? Well, I think it's referencing uh, the different ways that God has worked in our lives even maybe before we were Christians, but even during the time we became Christians, to prepare us for different uh, opportunities that we might have in ministry to others, and probably even utilizing our spiritual gifts. Okay, good, thank you. Any other thoughts on that? I think he's prepared each person with gifts, whether we use them for him or for the world. Okay, I agree with that. Because that's what God's word says, right? Yeah. So, can anyone think of a parable that relates to that? That Jesus spoke during his life in physical form on earth. That talks about using what he's given us. And then, anyone? The town. Kind of summarize that for me. The parable of the talents. Yeah. Well, one person, like the servant had five, or, and then the other servant had three, the other servant had one, and he went out and used them and grew them, and then used them and grew them, and the other one hid it in the ground. Okay, so, and what happened to, how did, the, uh, how did the boss man deal with the guy eventually who said, uh, I don't like the way you do business, so I just hid mine in the ground. He was not rewarded. Huh? Okay, worthless servant. And then he said, uh, give what he has to somebody who's used what he's been given, right? So what he had was taken away. Good, that's exactly the parable that I thought of too, thank you. Okay, so think about those of you who are working right now for a living, those of you who may be retired. Um, who of you feels that you are or were in a job or career that was a great fit for you? Or that is a great fit for you? Scott Lucason. Well, I, I think it helped me a lot to uh, grow up with a dad who was a funeral director in my funeral directing career. I think, you know, God uh, also enhanced that tremendously when I became a Christian. I, I don't think I could have done what I was able to do had I not had my relationship with God that I so part of your preparation was uh, growing up with a father who was a funeral director. Strange coincidence, my dad was one of those two. 
but God wasn't preparing me to be a funeral director. So isn't that, isn't that interesting? Anyone else? Feels like the career that you did or even part of your career or maybe just a job that you had for a while was a perfect fit for you. Bob? You know, I, I consciously made a decision in May of 1975 to quit college. And the reason is I was very, I was very, very introverted and I was very attracted to salespeople. And I, and I, I actually, very, I purposely actually walked into an insurance office and asked for a job and they hired me and then they didn't really train me. And over the next few months, there was one interesting thing that happened, but uh, I ended up getting into the cookware business. And in the cookware business, uh, it, you know, it was a small party type of deal. And it was really, you know, you memorized what you did. And, and I became very, very successful at that for a couple of years. You were a cookware party animal. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And I did very well at it, but it really, it, you know, it, oh, it, having something that was repetitive and interacting with people in a small group and that kind of stuff, it became very comfortable for me. Uh, and it did help me accomplish, you know, some of what I was trying to do uh, in, in becoming more, you know, more of a people person and, and more outgoing than I was. Because, I mean, you know, Matt Burleson always laughs, but <laughs> when, I tell, when I say this, but it's really true, I am a, an introvert that has tried to force himself to be an extrovert. Yeah. Okay. Good. Doris? Yeah. So, as long back as you can remember, you've loved being with kids, loved children, and that's prepared you to be, uh, to do what you do for a living. You, you're a child care giver, provider. Yeah. God blessed you with that gift, and it's something that you obviously were and are passionate about. So that's... It's a good indication, yeah. And it's a great way to serve people, too. Yes? I'm the same as Doris, but I didn't want kids. <laughs> I didn't want kids. I, was, I thought my life was on a certain track, and then I got pregnant. And so um, I got out of the Air Force to have more kids. I didn't like, intentionally move yeah. because I knew I couldn't do what I was doing in the Air Force and have a bunch of kids. And now I stay home with kids. And yeah, good. So it's the same as Doris, except for I didn't start with the little kids. <laughs> Maybe you did and you ignored it for a while? Okay, yeah. yeah, okay. Good, okay. Anyone else? I was thinking about me um, when I was preparing this to uh, lead this discussion and you know, Scott Laird and obviously Scott Lucasen and I, we grew up together in Three Forks, Montana. And when Scott Laird and I were in the same class from sixth grade all the way through graduating. And uh, Scott, when we were seniors in high school, Scott was the, he was the student body president. He was the senior class president and he was the Letterman's Club president. And I was the vice president of each of those. So we were, I don't know that you'd call us a dynamic duo, but we were a duo in many aspects of that. And I thought about that, and I was like, I was always more comfortable kind of being in the background and not the forefront. Um, doing things that were useful and needed, but not necessarily wanting the limelight, you know? Never really wanted to be the president of anything, but I was okay with vice president. So I thought that was interesting because that <clears throat> God led me to opportunities in the Air Force to be uh, a guy that's uh, protecting our nation 
from 40 feet underneath Montana. So I was, you know, I was out of view of most people, but I really enjoyed the responsibility of that without being in the limelight. So it's kind of interesting how that worked. Oh, also, uh, I, had a, I had a knack for singing um, ever since I can remember. And I realized that that's a gift that God gave me that I should try to use to encourage the church eventually. Um, like Michelle, I was kind of, it was a gift that I wasn't comfortable with or maybe tried to ignore when I was younger. Because again, I didn't like, my, my music teachers would always ask me to do solos at, at holiday concerts and stuff. And man, that, that was uncomfortable for me, but I did it. Um, so just some, some interesting ways that God was preparing me for works of service. Anyone else? Okay, <clears throat> let's discuss how God prepared Moses for the special assignment God had for him. When Genesis ended, Joseph had favor with the Egyptian Pharaoh and the name of Joseph's God was revered and honored. Why was that? What, what events led to that? state of Joseph and the Israelites being uh, favored in Egypt and also their God being, having a good name in Egypt. Well, the Lord blessed Joseph. Okay. Um, at, at every position he filled and uh, he really saved that country from the famine. Yeah. They all threw God, right? God did it, God used him. And so, because he did that, and Pharaoh saw it, um, that was definitely the, high, the pinnacle of getting the information out there yeah. was through Pharaoh. And of course, he would have done that. And Joseph always gave God the credit, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so, so that's, that's an interesting state, but when you read the next page in the Old Testament, the first beginning of uh, Exodus, which is about 400 years later in history, uh, it's not, not that way at all, is it? How is it? Huh? It's rough, isn't it? It's rough for Israel. It's rough. Uh, it says the, the Pharaoh forgot, didn't know anything about Joseph. Um, I don't know if their history papyruses or scrolls were up to date, but I'll bet Pharaoh could have done a little historical research and learned something about Joseph and Joseph's God if he would have done so. But it says he, uh, he didn't know about Joseph, he forgot about the God of Israel, um, and it was pretty rough. Uh, Egypt got kind of nervous because Israel was, the Israelites were, the Jewish nation was, was growing and prospering, right? So Pharaoh and his, and his henchmen got nervous about that. Why is that? Okay, and what's the threat there? Takeover. Huh? Takeover. Yeah, Pharaoh said, man, if these people want to rise up against us, they can wipe us out. We don't want that to happen. So how did they start treating the Jewish people? Huh? Slaves, right? Harsh work, punishment, um, abortion, right? Infanticide? Well, yeah. It started out asking the uh, midwives to, to kill the babies and lie and say they were stillborn, although the uh, midwives refused to do it. So then they um, started taking the newborn male infants and um, throwing them in the water. To yeah, drown. they were murdering Jewish babies, right? Pretty, uh, pretty rough circumstances. Pretty harsh treatment. 
Yet, our God was at work moving in mysterious ways, wasn't he? Let's talk further. Exodus 2 and verses 1 through 25. Let's read that. Uh, could somebody read? Let's go 1 through. Let me get there. One through fourteen. Who would like to read that for us out loud, Scott? One through fourteen. Yes. No man of the tribe of Levi married a Levi woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and covered it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it. And Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked the Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse it for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his people were and watched him at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian being in Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that, and seeing no one. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, you made, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. Okay, thanks. So, we see God at work here in saving Moses from the Pharaoh's edict of being killed. Uh, interesting thing that I learned today, the, the Hebrew word for basket is the same word as it is in Genesis, um, Genesis 6, where the scriptures talk about the ark. Isn't that interesting? So God used a water vessel and what did she coat it with? Pitch and tar, right? Same thing, same thing that was used for the ark by Noah. Just, I thought that was interesting. I, I didn't, I, I'd never heard that before. Maybe I had and I forgot it, but interesting factoid there. God was using a water vessel in each circumstance to preserve his people. God is powerful, isn't he? Amazing. <coughs> Okay, and then Moses' parents, <clears throat> in verses 7 through 9 of uh, what Scott just read, his parents went, because of God blessing them, they went from fearing for Moses' life to having assurance of his safety and earning a salary for caring for their own son. Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter started paying Moses' mom to take care of Moses, right? How cool is that? Talk about an increase in income, right? It's a God thing. Huh? It's a God thing. It is a God thing. <laughs> Only God, right? Yep. Amazing stuff. So we're just talking about the ways that um, God was preparing Moses. So let's read on 14 through 25. Anyone willing to read that out loud, please? <clears throat> 15 through 25. Okay. CJ, thanks. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. 
Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to rule their father, uh, he said, Why have you come back so soon to me? So they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses was willing to dwell with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died. And the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry for help, because of their bondage, rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Okay, thanks, C.J. So, <clears throat> back in Egypt, Moses sees an Egyptian mistreating other Hebrews, right? And he kills the Egyptian. He thought he could do it. He thought he did it, and no one knew it, right? He thought it was a secret. But what's the lesson in that? Nothing's in your sin always finds you out, right? So Moses was trying to fix things um, using his own strength, using his own abilities, using his own reasoning, and using the wrong methods. Well, we see that over and over in the scriptures too, don't we? Who else did that kind of thing? David. David. How so? Okay, he sinned by committing adultery with another man's wife, and then he tried to cover it up, right? By having the husband killed in battle, making sure that he was killed in battle, right? So David was trying to fix things his own way using the wrong methods. Any other thoughts on that? Bob? I want to say something about the Pharaoh's daughter. I see smoke coming out of your ears. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, the way I see God working here, you know, first of all, Moses' mother had to have enough faith, you know, to put her, to put her son in the water. Right. I mean, that took a tremendous amount of faith. And I hope that the right person would come along. Well, there wouldn't have been very many women in, in the entire nation that could have done what the Pharaoh's daughter did. Exactly. Because the bottom line is she defied her father. What she did was in complete defiance. God knew her heart. And, uh, and, and so it was really the, the, the biggest thing I see in the whole thing, you know, or, you know, early on is the aspect that God knew the Pharaoh's daughter's heart. And, and one of the things, you know, we live in a nation there's a lot of crazy things going on. And I find that as a phenomenal opportunity. There are people asking questions. And, and we need to be ourselves prepared to, to look for those people. And just ask them, what do you think? And not so much preach at people as ask them, what do you think of this? Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that, because again, I mean, it, it's, it's real clear in the story. She, she says, this is an Egyptian baby. Yeah, no she knew. There was no confusion, and I think already in her heart, what was going on in the nation deeply concerned her. Yeah, could be. Again, I mean, here she had everything, and, uh, and and God knew that, but God knew her heart. And we don't know people's hearts until we ask the right questions or put opportunity before them. Exactly. Good thought. Thank you. So. Moses tried to make things right using his own strength and his own reasoning and the wrong methods. And he got found out. What did he do? He flees to Midian and becomes a hero to seven daughters of, what was his name, Rule? Yeah. And he was so grateful for that that he helped his daughters that he welcomed Moses into the family. 
and said, you can marry any one of my daughters. And he did, and he had a child, had a couple children. And what did he become? What did he do for a living? A shepherd. Who else was a shepherd in the Old Testament? David, David right? Two great men of God who had some experience as shepherds. But what was the value in becoming a shepherd in that part of the country to Moses? He learned how to navigate that wilderness, right? Would he need that in the future? Amazing, isn't it? That's some cool stuff. Well, you're welcome to join my family. Uh, the only job I got is you can help me watch my flocks, right? And he did it for 40 years. I have never had one job for 40 years. I did the Air Force put up with me for 20, right? Can you imagine being a shepherd for 40 years? But the value, one of the values in that was he learned how to protect. He learned how to navigate in a wilderness, a wilderness that he was going to come in contact with later on as well, right? Um, so we see God preparing Moses all along his life journey to use him as his agent to address God's concerns. What were God's concerns at the time? Last verse of what CJ read. Because they were enslaved. Right. They were enslaved. They were in bondage. Right? You know what? God's concerns are still the same. He cares about people who are in bondage. What did Jesus save us from? Bondage to yes. sin. Right? Yeah. He saved us from that. So God's concerns are consistent. Here he wanted to free his people physically, but big picture, Jesus is going to come on the scene and save as many as who would accept him from spiritual bondage. Slavery to sin and Satan and death, right? That's good stuff. Okay. So... <clears throat> Our two key truths, God prepares us to serve him. And this is what I want you to think about to make this practical. How has God prepared you to serve throughout your life? And I want you to think about some of the details of that. We've already talked about, some of you have already shared some of that with us. Um, but what a, what a great thing if you're struggling any day to think about Something to give God thanks for. Thank him for how he's prepared you to get to this point in life, you know? So God prepares us to serve him and he has a place for service for each of us. So we need to trust God through the circumstances of life, knowing he can use anything to prepare us to serve him. God can use good, bad, and ugly in our lives to prepare us if we're open to his guidance. Okay, let's look at uh, some passages in Exodus chapter 3. So I'm going to read uh, out loud and I'm glad to do it. Uh, Exodus 3, 1 through 10, please. Bob? <coughs> Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. 
Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Okay, thanks, Bob. <clears throat> so God calls Moses, and he wants him to help free his people from bondage. And when God goes to the bush that seems to be burning, but is not really burning up, God talks to Moses, and what, what does he tell him? Three different things. Don't come any closer. Why not? Huh? He, he told Moses, don't come any closer. You're close enough right now. Why? Why did he say don't come any closer? Okay. Okay, we'll talk about the sandals a little later. Right. Who is God? He's a holy God. He's perfect. Was Moses perfect? Could he actually be right there together with God, touching God? No. What would have happened? He would have died probably. So God is saying, you're close enough. You get any closer, it's not going to go well for you, I think. And we have had that same separation from God, right? You couldn't come close to God because of our sin, right? So the second thing he says is take off your sandals. Why is that? Okay, it's holy ground, but I don't, what's the connection? Your shoes are dirty. Scott? Well, the connection to us would be we too have dirty shoes of sin. Okay. That we have to be willing to repent of and get rid of before we can have that right relationship with God. And we really can't deal with our own sin, can we? We have to let Jesus take care of our sin by being baptized into Jesus and dying to our old life, right? So that's our taking off of our sandals. Plus, for Moses, it was an opportunity. God wanted to see if Moses would show God respect, um, an act of respect and humility. And Moses did. He took off his sandals. Well, it's even um, down the road a ways. The sandal was a, when you exchanged a sandal or took your sandal off. It was a contract. Okay. You see that with Ruth and the brother that, or the uncle that came and are you going to take her or not? And if not, and it was an exchange of the sandal. And I don't know if the sandal had anything to do with it here, but is God telling Moses, you know, this is between me and you, I need your sandals off? No, oh, good point. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Mike? The reason Moses couldn't approach God is because he hadn't been circumcised. All of the all the uh, Israelites had to be circumcised on the eighth day. Moses was not done that because he was raised in an Egyptian household. Therefore, he was unclean. Hmm. And he could not approach God being unclean. And therefore, and you, you see this later because when he leaves to take the Israelites, and bring him out of Egypt, God is going to kill him, but his wife intervenes and circumcises him on the road so that he would be clean and God wouldn't kill him. Good thought, yeah. And what does the New Testament say our spiritual circumcision is? Baptism into Christ, again, right? That's the only way 
our sin can be dealt with is if we're in Jesus, baptized into Christ, after we hear the message, the good news, and we repent, and we commit ourselves, we surrender to God, basically. You know, that's uh, one of the ironies in my life is surrender is not a, a, a popular concept in the military. But surrender has to take place if you're going to be <coughs> right with God. You have to surrender to God's lordship, right? So interesting stuff there. So don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. And then he says, I am the God of your father, Abraham. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And I'm the God of Jacob. What was the uh, relevance of God saying that to Moses? Okay, that's one of them, good. Think about Moses' background. He's been surrounded by all these weird Egyptian false gods that Egyptians worshipped. And, and I think part of it was God wanted him to focus. Okay, I am the God of your Jewish people's forefathers. I'm not the God of Egypt. I am, I am separate. I am holy. I am the true and living God. Um, <clears throat> so God wanted Moses to know for sure who he was. Okay, so Moses' good work that God called him to do was what? What was God preparing Moses to do for all of his life? Free the people, right? Free the people from Egypt. Lead them, lead them out of bondage, right? So, what are your and my good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do? That God's been preparing you and me individually with our unique life circumstances to do. What does God want us to do? Mike? The thing of God was a good Samaritan. You never know at any point in your life when there is someone that's willing to help. And we all have the means to help in some way. And the good Samaritan is just an example of, uh, of the good works that are around us every day, could be done, but yet, you know, everybody's thinking somebody else will do it. Yeah. And, and so the good Samaritan is, is a great example of those works that God has prepared in advance. Yeah, good. Okay. So, a little later on, we're not going to read this for lack of time, but what is, how does Moses respond to God? Sure, God, I'm there with you. Let's go do this. What did he say? I can't do this. Huh? Are you sure you want me? I'm not that great of a speaker. Uh, I'm a shepherd, right? So Moses doubted what? His abilities? And what did God say in response to that? I'm going to be with you through this. And that's a promise that we have too as well, right? Because God said, I'm, I'm going to be with you. Where? Where does it say that? Where is it written? Huh? Everywhere. Everywhere. Give me one example. Matthew 28, verse 20. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Right? I will never forsake you. Isn't it great to see? It, it's just cool to see how God dealt with his people, said the same things back then as he tells us today. Joshua, be strong and courageous. Right. Right, exactly. Um, and then <laughs> Moses also doubted what? He said, okay, when I go talk to your people, they're going to ask me, um, 
Who is this God? Who, how, do you, how do you know this is God that's been talking to you? And what does God say? Yeah. Tell them I what? Am who I, am. I am who I am. I am. The great I am. Right? So God was saying, answering Moses' doubts, he's saying, tell the people that I alone am eternal, I am self-existing, and I am faithful to my people. Right? Promises. Bob? Well, I just think, you know, Moses kind of forgot over the 40 years, he was raised a leader. I mean, you know, when he killed the Egyptian, he had the authority to do so, basically, but even though he tried to do it privately, maybe because of his nationality, and people do that, but I mean, he was, he was a leader, he kind of forgot that, and I was sitting here thinking about somebody that uh, some of us know, a lot of us don't, but the most natural leader I've ever met in my entire life, and I consider him a very humble brother, is Butch Usby from Helen. And if, if you know Butch very well at all, I mean, I just consider Butch a very nice, very humble guy, but what he has done in his career, he's just a leader. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I when I think about that, I, I'd love to know, you know, he was very close to his dad, and his dad became a Christian late in Butch's life, which was very important to Butch's own spiritual life, but but I wonder what his dad taught him. And I think he learned a lot of things about it, but he just was, he, he was just a leader. What he did, you know, with our Montana Highway Patrol, and, and you know, now he works for the Department of Justice, all this stuff, and he's just, I mean, he's just a humble guy. Yeah, he is. Good guy. Like, yep, good but, thought. But he gets stuff done. <laughs> so in closing, our task is to find the place of service God has for us. Maybe you already know that. Maybe you already know where God wants you to serve, how he wants you to serve, what gifts he's given you. Some people don't know that for themselves. So those who don't know, how do we find that place of service where God wants us to serve? Right things will be put in front of you. Okay, yeah. opportunities, right? Yeah. Opportunities you to may, serve. You may if, be qualified or not qualified. Right. You do it, and then you get qualified. If someone in the church says, hey, I've noticed this ability in you, would you be willing to do blank? Give it a try. Give it a shot. Because God may be using that person to say, you need to use this gift. And I'm going to bless you in using that gift. Right? So opportunities, how else? How else can we find where God wants us to serve, Diana? I think oftentimes God puts us in, in situations, not always situations that we want to be in or go through them, mm -hmm. but God does that so that we can uh, reach out to others who have who later are going through that same circumstance. Yeah. To, to give them hope and, and encouragement. God can use the stuff that you have suffered in life and the stuff that I have suffered in life to bless other people. Because suffering is pretty much universal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Everyone goes through tough things. So ask God, hey, is there something that I've gone through that I didn't really enjoy that I can serve you in, Lord? Pray, pray for God's guidance. God, guide me in the ways that you want me to serve. Because that's what we're here for. Volunteer to serve. <clears throat> and also there are tools. Gifts analysis, right? If you haven't done that, do it. And if you don't know how to do that, um, talk to one of the elders, the evangelists. They know where those resources are. Okay. There's actually some printed up right on the back counter there. If you don't know what your gifts are from God, there's a tool back there that you can use. Okay, good. Any questions? Any rebuttal? I got a question. I just, just bring up my, I can't find anywhere because it's not reported that Moses was circumcised uh, during the Exodus. I, I can't find that. Not, not during the Exodus, before the Exodus. I can't even find that. I found where um, circumcised his and son. And, 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 and the chapters he did, but I know when, 
Moses took his family and and left to to Egypt. And his father, uh, when he left his father-in-law, God was going to kill him, and his wife stepped right. in and circumcised him. Right. No, that was a sign. That was a sign. Was that's it? I, I can't follow. What was the sign? Yeah, I can't, I can't see it because, because he was a Levi, right? The tribe of Levi, and they, did, they would have done it at a very young age. And since he was raised by his mom and dad, and obviously they, they taught him a, a lot, right? Because of how much knowledge and information he had. Okay, when, when it, Moses, I mean, it's in Exodus 4, verse 24. It says, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said that you're a bridegroom of blood to me. And so then when you look... That's um, Moses' son. Right. And then when you look into the reference, it says that the bridegroom of blood was referring to the circumcision that Moses was also not circumcised at that time. But it doesn't say it like. I don't know. About that. But now, really, they, I mean, when Moses was a baby, and that was their law, circumcised them. Right. So why wouldn't he have done that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a discussion for yeah, another that's time. That's a good discussion because I'm not sure. Everybody comes with uniform. It doesn't really matter to you and I. No, it doesn't, but I want to. <laughs> um, we need to be circumcised spiritually by being baptized into Christ. Um, but that's an interesting uh, factoid that CJ will look up and figure it out. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, discussion tonight. God bless you and the rest of this week, and have a great week. Thanks.